abortion is not about life. It is about power and control over our bodies. Who's losing the most is folks of color, gender non-conforming, non-binary and transgender abortion seekers. We have to continue to fight and we have to continue to follow the voices of Black and BIPOC communities. We're rising above the ashes of Roe v. Wade. The way forward is reproductive justice. Still coming up on the Laura Fly the Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. What does the coverage of the Supreme Court's overthrow of Roe versus Wade reveal about our media, our journalists asking the right questions, and what difference are BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color media making to the way that people with real life experience are able to influence policy. This week, Mitra Kalita and Sarah Lomax-Reese of URL Media are back for our monthly Meet the BIPOC Press Roundtable. This time, they are joined by two women with experience as activists and in politics. They are Assemblywoman Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, who represents District 34 in Queens, New York, and she's the sponsor of a bill that would fund abortions for out-of-state women, and Latasha D. Mays. Democratic nominee for the Pennsylvania House from District 24 in the heart of Pittsburgh. Both our guests come to politics from a long history in organizing on this issue. Mays with the group New Voices for Reproductive Justice and Gonzalez Rojas in the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. It's an important conversation. Mitra, Sarah, over to you. I can't wait to join you at the end of it for a debrief. Thanks a lot, Laura. Um... It's great to be here for this edition of Meet the BIPOC Press. Let me just uh, open up with a a real basic question. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, how have Black and Brown communities been disproportionately impacted? And how do you see the coverage that the media is doing around this issue as it relates to BIPOC communities? Um, Are they covering it in effective and meaningful ways? And I'll throw that first to you, Latasha. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. Uh, As a reproductive justice leader and organizer for over two decades, I think that we are in such a watershed moment. Uh, We are in a new era that the mainstream media as well as mainstream reproductive uh, health and rights organizations are calling a post-Roe world. Uh, But for black women and folks of color and poor abortion seekers, We've been living in a post world world uh, before June 24. And so what I do see is far greater representation of Black women, leaders in the reproductive justice movement, uh, women and folks of color. There are more stories, more coverage. There's more depth to, the, to how our stories are being told. And we're also telling our own stories like today. Assembly member Gonzalez Rojas, what's your take on the coverage and the impact on BIPOC women and, and communities? We know what it meant to have Roe as a right, but no access to that right because of immigration status, because of racial identity, because of where you live in the country, um, because how much money you have in your pocket. Uh, because you're transgender or gender non-conforming. We know Roe has not actually been a right for so many people, but to actually strip off of that right nationally it is terrifying. Um, so as now a state legislator, I, I, I represent a predominantly diverse and immigrant-centric district of Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and Woodside, um, the home of Mitra as well. Um, We we know the impacts of our community. We know that this is gonna be far more difficult for people of color to access the reproductive healthcare that we need. And that's why I introduced uh, the Reproductive Freedom and Equity Fund Act um, in the assembly. It's called A10148 is the number. Um, And it would provide the resources to ensure that New York is actually a safe haven is an actual safe haven, not by just providing resources to providers and clinics to allow for more capacity, uh, uh, security, um, recruitment, all the things that they need um, to provide care, but actual funding and resources um, to communities directly that need access to that care. So it would provide grants to organizations like abortion funds 
that gets the money right in the hands of the people that need the care most. And it's often the women of color, communities of color, queer and trans communities that um, are gonna be left to die if not have access to these important resources. One uh, thread I saw immediately after the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe was this call uh, from black and brown women saying, please don't make us the afterthought here. And from a media perspective, please don't make us the sidebar, meaning the main story will be about Americans as mainstream media defines Americans. And then it'll be how are black women in the South going to get abortions as though somehow that's separate from the fundamentals of what has been lost. Is the consciousness there now? Do, do people get how much has been lost? I don't even know if we have enough time to, to really dig into this because it is, we're talking about decades and generations of Black women leading work for reproductive justice, organizing for reproductive justice long before 1994 when our movement was created by 12 Black women in Chicago who were saying the same thing. Don't make Black women an afterthought. Don't make women of color and afterthought. And out of that came a, a, a strong, powerful movement for reproductive justice. What I'll say is that I think that we are in a, in a moment where people are like, oh shoot, we've lost our rights. And I don't know if it's human nature or not, but we, we don't re react or respond or pay attention until we lose. And so, but who's losing the most? It's black folks, it's folks of color. Um, is gender non-conforming, non-binary and transgender abortion seekers. And that's, I think, in terms of media and how we talk about abortion access, that is the greatest change I've seen around being more expansive around gender. So I just said to a room of suburban white women the other day that a, saying a woman's right to choose uh, supposes that everybody who needs an abortion identifies or is a woman and that everybody has equal and equitable choices uh, when they're seeking this critical care. The Supreme Court case was about Black women. I don't think that is understood. The only clinic in Mississippi brought th their grievance to our Supreme Court. And so Mississippi has such a, a great representation of Black people. So then of course this impacts Black women. I don't think the media talked about it in that way. It's just the Dobbs case. But who it really was about the actual lawsuit and the actual Supreme Court decision, that was about Black women in the South. And so I, I think people have greater awareness and consciousness. I think our movement for reproductive justice have brought, has brought us to this moment, has brought us to a time where people were like, okay, yeah, the way we were talking about this probably wasn't right. Our political and legislative strategy was not inclusive. It was not intersectional. It was not multi-strategy. And reproductive justice as a movement, as a framework, and as a practice has always been that. So what I tell people now is we're rising above the ashes of Roe v. Wade and that the way forward is reproductive justice. And the way forward is Black and Brown and folks of color at not only the center, but at, in the leadership of, of a movement for reproductive justice, we were not, that include, it includes reproductive health and rights, but it is not, it is a much broader human rights based approach to abortion access, the ability to control our bodies, our sexuality, our gender, our work, our reproduction, the ability to form our families. Jessica, what's your reaction to that? I, I should say I've known you for 25 years. You started out as an immigration rights advocate pivoted to reproductive justice and health, and now are in the state assembly. And so the trajectory um, in many ways is exactly what Latasha is talking about there. Do, do you see the public getting it though? Audrey Lord has said, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And reproductive justice is the epitome of that. It understands that we cannot fully achieve the ability for someone to determine if, when, and how to create a family and then be able to raise that family um, without the conditions that allow us to do so. So for example, you know, in my work, we did a lot of work with, with undocumented communities. In a world where we have the draconian immigration policies that we do, we cannot ever see reproductive justice if we continue to see families being torn apart. 
So immigration is a reproductive justice issue. As Latasha clearly laid out, racial justice is a reproductive justice movement. And that's so important and why it's critical that people like us are involved in, in politics and civic engagement and are advocates to change the root cause of some of these, these, these systems, right? We have to look at the ways we can change the policies to really fully address that. But it is the organizer, it is the people on the ground, it is the communities most impacted who we need to listen to. And, and I just wanna recognize that since the dawn of our, of our country, since the founding of our country, we've pathologized and harmed black women and black people. And this is just a continuation of that. And we really need to own that. We had the Moynihan Report that created the, the welfare queen and this was about black motherhood. So we're still looking at a system in which, you know, in New York State, three times uh, as many black women die from childbirth than white women, right? So we have to look, this very, look at this very holistically and we have to look at this as a racial justice issue. And, and abortion is not about life. It is about power and control over our bodies. And that's something we need to name. It is forced pregnancy, it is forced childbearing, and we have to continue to fight and we have to continue to follow the voices of Black and BIPOC communities. I think we also have to follow the money because I think this issue is also an economic justice um, conversation. So uh, I want to make it clear for the audience that most abortions are provided by freestanding independent clinics. In Pennsylvania specifically, over 80% of our counties do not have an abortion provider. Pittsburgh, where I hope to represent the 24th Legislative District, we have two abortion providers in our county. So we have in, in states next to Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania specifically, in Ohio, where there's an abortion ban, in West Virginia, where there's an abortion ban in Point to West, they will now be traveling to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh will be one of the top five places that abortion seekers flock to during this time, during this time of confusion and chaos and misinformation about the legality of abortion access where they live and where they're, they're, they're traveling to. So when we think about that, most counties don't have an abortion clinic or provider. There are limited providers where they do exist, like in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County in Pennsylvania. So a person has to not only account for the cost of an abortion uh, procedure, but they also have to take off work. They're gonna need at least two days in Pennsylvania because of our draconian laws that you know, strip us of our human right to make decisions for ourselves. So there's a 24 hour waiting period. You probably took off work to go get your abortion. You have to travel there. Maybe you have to rent a car, you have to certainly pay for gas and tolls, and then you need a place to sleep. So these are, and then you, if you have children already, which most people who have abortion, they already have children, they're already parents, they need, they'll probably need childcare for them. So what I've been saying is abortion access is not just about a legal right. It's about whether a person has the financial material resources and conditions to be able to get the abortion care that they need. And we have to look at total costs when we talk about uh, the, economic ingest, it, the economic injustice of it all. And that is what black and brown communities are dealing with because of the intersection of class and economic oppression. So I just wanna pick up on that thread, Jessica, with you, your bill um, you know, essentially creates a safe haven out of New York wondered if you could pick up on Sarah's question about finances and then relate it to the legislation that you've introduced. So the Reproductive Freedom and Equity Fund does three things. It provides resources to clinics and providers to do everything from get more staff to retrofit their space to get security because we know there's a lot of security threats. Um, number two, it provides funding for those who are underinsured uninsured or whose assurance aren't accepted in that, those particular clinics. And three, and most importantly to this conversation, it provides grants to nonprofits that work directly with communities, uh, with abortion seekers to facilitate access to abortion. And as Latasha mentioned, this means everything from providing childcare to travel, uh, to a, an abortion doula if they'd like, um, to hotel stay, 
these are the practical needs to actually get people to New York so that New York can be a safe access state for anyone who needs that. If we are going to say we are a safe haven, we must be a safe haven and we must put our dollars behind that. It is not a panacea because as my work has shown over the last 13 years at the National Latina Institute, that people who are undocumented, um, people who can't take time off, who work in jobs that don't allow for that freedom and that accessibility, there are so many barriers still to those to be able to get to states like New York, even if the money is there. So I do want to acknowledge that because there's a lot of people that just can't cross state lines, even if they had the childcare resources, even if they had a plane ticket, even if they had money and a place to stay, there's still those barriers. So there's, we still need federal action um, and much greater federal action that's been done, but we need federal action to make sure that everyone can access uh, safe uh, and safe abortion care. For so many young women, they, you know, always had access to uh, to safe and, and and legal abortion. And so I'm, I wonder, with both of you in electoral politics, coming out of community um, activism, what is your sense of how this issue is going to play out in terms of energizing voter turnout, as particularly um, for for women of color um, in the midterms? I cannot stress this enough that the attack on reproductive justice has been a galvanizing force in campaigns across the nation and my race specifically um, as, and I know Jessica, when she ran originally, we were already talking about abortion access and we were speaking about it apologetically, which is far different than at least in Pennsylvania and where I live in Pittsburgh, the, the partisan party politics where they were not bold and, and, and unapologetic in speaking about speaking directly to the issues that are on the minds of voters and residents in our communities in my district in the region. And I think that translates across the state, even to uh, Philadelphia, Sarah. Like, you know, the work I've done as the former president CEO of the Voice of Reproductive Justice, we, we, I think I credit that work for 18 years of priming the ground to educate Black women and Black communities about reproductive justice, so that when this when this when this moment came, that we knew that we in the reproductive justice movement knew was coming, that we would be ready. And I told people on my on my on the campaign trail that the movement for reproductive justice prepared me to run for office. But but Latasha, I, let me just say this because there has been conversation on Word, which is a Black talk radio station, that Black people this that the the abortion issue is not a an issue that resonates or feel like is is going to move people to the polls and i want you to respond to that is because there are like you know issues around morality and all of this stuff when we think about talking about abortion in direct terms and how that plays out in the black community specifically and is it actually going to move people to go to the polls it, it certainly will move black women to the polls and i just want to say that uh, Black Americans in general are supportive of Roe v. Wade, have, have been, and they're supportive of us trusting Black women to make these decisions for ourselves. And that is quantifiable polling research that uh, our national policy convener in our own voice, National Black Women's Reproductive Justice Agenda, we did research to ask Black people how they felt about, how they felt about abortion access, and overwhelmingly they were supportive. We're talking about 70%. 80%, making sure it's available in, the, in communities, making sure it's taught in our curriculum, uh, health, um, our, our comprehensive sex education curriculums, making sure that doctors direct healthcare, not legislators. And so I know from the work that I've done and, and led, and I know from quantifiably asking Black folks, we are supportive, even regardless of our religious or political affiliation. And I think that is not that is not an angle that the media talks about too, and so I think that you definitely have vocal uh, a vocal um, few who you know who call into the station and talk about it's not going to move us to the polls, but that's not true because I've done work that has moved Black women voters specifically to the polls where we outpace and outperform all other groups in the uh, electorate in Pennsylvania and nationally. So as, as someone who's been on the ground working at this intersection of 
policy and activism and electoral justice, that, that I, would, I would argue it in that way. One of the goals of our network is exactly to pick up on what Latasha said is highlight these issues in the media. So I wondered if I could ask um, each of you, and I'll start with Jessica, what's a story that you think we need to be covering both uh, within BIPOC media as well as mainstream media right now? I think it's telling the, the real stories and the lived experiences of your everyday person who seeks an abortion. That person is generally already a parent. That person is often struggling economically. That person may have made the decision for an array of reasons and it doesn't matter. And that's what those stories need to be. It is our neighbor, it is our loved one. Renee Bracey Sherman says, everyone loves someone who's had an abortion, whether you know it or not. And I think that's what's really important. The, I, I worry that the media has sensationalized this issue in a way that has a fuel the partisan divide. Um, we know Republicans get abortions. We know Democrats get abortions. It is, it is beyond these other identities. We have to make sure we're telling the stories of the everyday people that, that need and seek abortion care. Um, and it is, it is the people in our lives that we love and care about. And that's just really critical because the sensationalization of this issue as a hot button issue makes it more and more difficult to actually address that health disparities and the health inequities that we're seeing across this country. Because again, abortion is connected to the full spectrum of reproductive health care, whether it starts with sex ed and ends with you know, menopause and, and all these other um, needs that we aren't talking about. So it, it, it's so critical to really paint this as uh, an issue that anyone in our lives will have to, will, might face. Three stories that the media and the BIPOC media should be covering is how Black women voters will save uh, Pennsylvania and so many other states from abortion bans with our organizing and our leadership and our vision for reproductive justice. I think we should be covering, I think you all should be covering uh, abortion, how to provide abortion access on federal lands, including places like Pennsylvania where abortion is still legal. Uh, I think we should be covering the stories of black and brown folks who are providing abortions in abortion clinics and through abortion funds. And lastly, um, how we absolutely should be defunding, defunding crisis pregnancy centers uh, or fake clinics in places like Pennsylvania where our government gives over $7 million to lie to largely black and brown and poor folks about abortion access. Just so you know, in New York State, again, the bastion of support for abortion, we have more crisis pregnancy center, more fake clinics than abortion clinics. Thank you for being so concrete, not just on those ideas, but throughout this conversation. It's been fabulous. Assembly member Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, Latasha D. Mays, thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. You two, so important, that conversation. I mean, media have been critical. If you think of how this issue moved from the margins to the mainstream of right-wing politics and how they used local media and ideological media and pressured politicians, how this history happened, media at the center of it. And your guests just put their finger on it so beautifully, um, what the BIPOC press can be doing differently and are doing, I think, to result in different outcomes. Sarah and I have actually talked quite a bit about the framing of abortion within our communities. And what I really loved about this conversation was how they connected it to so many issues of policy that... Um, where abortion is not front and center, but has everything to do with it. So for me, it was a real, it kind of, I, I leave feeling resolved to frame that better. And then I gotta say within my own communities, I think your viewers know I'm a daughter of Indian immigrants raised in Puerto Rico. Both of those communities do not talk in the open way you see on social media where white women are saying, you know, I had an abortion at 19. It changed the trajectory of my life. They make it very, very concrete. I do not see that conversation happening in my communities. And I think it is the role of our media to facilitate that a little bit. Sarah, I mean, I don't know how many times we say this, but how different would history have been if the story had been covered differently from the beginning? There is a lot of shame. There's a lot of judgment and a lot of silence around this issue in the Black community, similar to what Mitra was saying in, in the South Asian and immigrant communities. We need to tell our stories. We need to tell Black and Brown women's stories so we normalize and, and connect it with the continuum of 
reproductive health and wellness and justice. So it's not just this um, silent, you know, uh, backroom thing that you do and you hide, but it is a part of our full range of, of, uh, of services, of access to, to full reproductive health and wellness that changes the trajectory of women's lives. So I just think it was a powerful conversation. Yeah, I love the Assemblywoman saying, it's not about life, it's about control. Um, Sarah, Mitra, thank you as ever. Thank, thank you. you, Laura. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.